and welcome to this special edition of Market Masters. Global financial markets are sitting on the edge, as it were, with respect to the two largest economies of the world. In the US, there is renewed hope for a year-end rally on expectations that both inflation and the pace of Fed rate hikes may have peaked. On China, there are only worrisome questions on the country's real estate space, its zero-COVID policy, and the implications of Xi Jinping's third term. Today, we have with us a veteran to parse these global cues with us and tell us what this holds for Indian equities. Christopher Wood, Global Head of Equity Strategies, Jeffries, and author of the legendary weekly report, Greed and Fear. Chris, thank you very much for sparing time for us. And let me start with the question Goodbye. that's on everyone's mind. Are we in for a Santa Claus rally, a week in, a year in rally in uh, the United States? Yeah, I, th I think there is a possibility of, of a, a rally into year, year end, partly because the next CPI data point, which should come out just after the midterm elections, has a slightly has a better base effect. First point, second point, if the midterm uh, elect congressional elections go in a way which the market perceives to be positive. I think both those events um, can trigger a bit of a, a rally into year-end, most particularly as we're down heavily year-to-date. Okay. However, having said that, looking into 2023, the fact is the odds favor a U.S. recession. That is Jeffrey's formal call, and I concur with that. And probably the best uh, lead indicator of the recession risk in the U.S., next year is the collapse in broad money supply growth. In the last six months, M2 has not grown at all in America. But yes, I think there is a chance for a, a, a rally if that CPI data point comes, up, comes out lower. So your theory would be that it is a year-end rally, but it is a, a tactical short-term trader rally, and we could be in for some losses in 23. Yeah, because it, my, my, what was interesting last week is we finally got a capitulation on some major U.S. tech stocks. Clearly, um, the fact, Facebook was now called Meta is the best example of that. But the S&P basically held up. So that shows you the market is quite resilient. And one thing we need to remember about the higher inflation, while it leads to higher um, interest rates, it also leads to higher nominal GDP growth and earnings are in nominal terms. But fundamentally, if rates are going up and the Fed balance sheet is contracting and money supply growth has gone to zero, that that is negative for asset prices. And in my view, the well, before this correction is over in the US, we need to see major capitulation on all the FANG stocks. So I've got a chart in my presentations last two years showing fangs as a percentage of the S&P 500. And they peaked back in 2020, but that line's going to go a lot lower. And fundamentally, the best sector to have owned last year and this year in America is energy, which remains my favorite sector to own stock-wise. Hi, Chris. Yes. Hello, yep. All right. Hi, Chris. Good to speak to you. You know, if Nasdaq is going to go much lower from here, uh, you know, are there any targeted levels that you're looking at? And also, if the midterm elections, uh, you know, they play out according to plan, inflation is well behaved, as is perceived, at least as of now, in the coming couple of uh, months. Uh, how much higher could we go with regard to the Santa Claus rally that you're talking about? No, no, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not looking to portray this rally. Um, I just want to own energy stocks. What I'm saying is though, that you can get a bit of a, uh, of a bounce, mm -hmm. but we need to keep a perspective of inflation. Inflation is way above uh, the Fed's target, mm -hmm. both core and headline. Um, I'm just saying it could come in lower the next reporting date, and markets like to celebrate the second derivative. But the, fundamentally, the inflation remains way higher than the Fed's target. So the key issue for the first quarter of 2023 is will the Fed stick religiously to this 2% target? Or will the Fed, when it sees growing evidence of a weakening labor market and a weaker US economy, in due course fudge that 2% target? In my view, they will fudge that 2% target. 
and that will be the real signal to buy equities. But if they continue to tighten, that is very. That's the point, uh, uh, Chris. We al already have Nick Timiros writing in the Wall Street Journal that uh, several Fed governors are beginning to get worried about the pace of rate hikes. And uh, that was actually uh, confirmed by uh, some of the Fed governors, uh, like Daly, speaking out uh, that they are worried about the pace of rate hikes. So would you weigh the, uh, the chances as high that the Fed may chicken out and not and go in for contraction? And in my base case is the Fed will fudge it, absolutely. <laughs> okay. but, if you're, but if you're along the minor, the, the key question is the timing. Mm. And the problem for the Fed is that the Fed has lost credibility um, in the last 18 months for the obvious reason that it totally failed to predict the source saw the surge in inflation and the reason it failed to predict the surge in inflation is the fed doesn't pay any attention to money supply growth and if you look at a chart of broad money supply growth back in 2020 it was pretty obvious that inflation was going to come back so the fed was flying blind unfortunately the fed is still flying blind because the fed still doesn't pay any attention to broad money supply growth and broad money supply growth has now collapsed so the Fed is, in a, is partly in a political mission to restore its credibility, and the Fed has an employment mandate, and the employment market is, is, remains today relatively strong. So, uh, but obviously the labor market's a lagging indicator. But my guess is in the next first three months of next year, the, um, the evidence of a weakening economy will see more Fed governors talking in the way that that Wall Street Journal article reported. And by the way, that journal article was very influential because it triggered the commencement of this rally we've seen in the recent days. But I think the key Fed governor for investors to watch out for in terms of delivering the message, at least the one I'm going to be watching out for, is Fed Vice Chair uh, Mrs. Brainard, who would have been the Fed chairman, but uh, that she wasn't going to get the Republican votes to confirm her. She's, uh, she's politically connected. She's a Democrat, and she's a labor market specialist, so when I think she will be the one to deliver the signal. But I just don't think this, to me, that article was a little bit premature, the one that happened a week ago. Fair point. Uh, okay, actually, yeah, the Fed balance sheet has shrunk by about quarter trillion, I would think, uh, because of the, uh, you know, Treasury runoff. Uh, you know, I'm trying to keep Nigel from getting into India immediately. That's the question he wants to fire at you. But I want first your views on China. Uh, I mean, we have uh, uh, the, the property market problems, the zero COVID. Uh, what is your sense? Uh, is China going to continue with the zero COVID? Uh, do you see any relief at all for China investors? Well, I have to say the base case was that uh, President Xi would not formally uh, <clears throat> um, basically move away from what I, call, I prefer to call it COVID suppression because the Chinese aren't claiming to have zero COVID. The whole policy is about suppressing outbreaks where they occur. So the base case, yes, is that China maintains this policy, as was articulated in that Communist Party meeting last week. But the base case is also, I believe, at least my base case, is very gradual relaxation, though that's not formally admitted in Beijing. The best signal that we're going to have gradual relaxation is that President Xi has stopped wearing masks all the time in meetings. That's probably the most significant um, signal. We, I believe they're going to have a marathon Beijing in, in the near term. <clears throat> They've stopped quarantine in you know, people going into Hong Kong. There's talk they're going to relax quarantine measures for people entering China because foreign business will need to go into China. So I do believe that it's very gradual relaxation. But the problem China's got, and it is a, a, a real public health problem, is that they haven't vaccinated all the elderly people. They didn't prioritize the elderly when they started vaccination. And Hong Kong is unfortunately the precedent for China because Hong Kong also failed to prioritize vaccinating elderly people. And this has become a real issue with Omicron because it's so much more infectious. Hong Kong had the highest death rate on, on, in Omicron globally because the population had no immunities because of the extreme lockdown prior to that. We worked out the other day that if you um, adjust Hong Kong's Omicron death rate for China's population, 
and China lost control of Omicron like Hong Kong did, then you would have 1.9 million Chinese. So that's the key reason why they're not relaxing as much as many people would think. Oh. But clearly the failure to relax COVID suppression policy is inflicting major collateral damage on the Chinese economy and most particularly the property market. Mm. But uh, Chris, you know, let's get to the point then with regard to emerging markets. The Chinese market has, uh, you know, hadn't had a good run. Some believe that maybe it had become uninvestable. If they are bottoming out and things are going to reopen out there, valuation-wise, they have that comfort. Between both the two markets, that's India's offering, you know, earnings growth, Chinese, they are, that market's offering valuation comfort. How would you approach both of them? Well, yeah, but China's been offering valuation comfort relative to India all calendar year. Yeah. So if the Chinese announced today a total opening of COVID, uh, 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 you know, end of this COVID suppression policy, I would say the market will be up 25% in two weeks. Oh. But, the base, but the base case is that, you know, they're not going to do that. And the reality is that global most global investors have already uh, deemed China uninvestable. But that's global investors who do not have to invest in emerging markets. Global emerging market investors have to invest in China because it's a major part of the benchmark. But what you will increasingly see, and this process has already begun, you will increasingly see growing interest in global emerging market mandates excluding China. Okay. You know, that's a big one that you're giving us, uh, Chris. We want to hear more about this and about the relative comfort in uh, investing in India. Have to take a mandatory break. We are back in just 10 seconds. Welcome back. We've been in conversation with Christopher Wood, the global head of equity strategy at Jefferies. Of course, an undisputed veteran. Uh, Chris, you know, you were telling Nigel that more and more investors are asking about an ex-China EM uh, basket. Uh, you know, have people already started investing on those lines or do you see a major shift, new indexes being adopted? No, no, people have started to do this, but actually this is a bit ironic. Originally, about three years ago, this idea was kicked off because China was such a big part of the benchmark that people just, and the A shares were going to get included more and more, the main, mainland market, that the view was that it's better to have your China dedicated mandate because otherwise it would dominate the benchmark and the, and the rest of the emerging market should be treated separately. So that was the origins of okay. this idea, but in the last two years, it's actually morphed into the fact that more and more people are viewing China as uninvestable, or particularly in the case of the US, there's obviously growing political pressure for some quarters not to invest in China at all for geopolitical reasons. Okay. So for both reasons, this trend is growing. But I've been advising you know, fund managers who have uh, emerging market businesses, they should definitely come up with, they haven't done it already, and some have, with a product offering ex-China. Because oh. mm. there's going to be growing demand. Fair point. And clearly, all this means that India's benchmark weighting would be higher in such a, um, in such a portfolio. Mm. Well, such a benchmark. Right. Uh, you know, Chris, I wanted to ask you about a couple of other asset classes besides equity as well. Uh, emerging mm. markets like us, we track uh, you know, the dollar index closely as well. It went to around 115, but cooled off from there. What's your sense on that front? And crude is a big factor here. Uh, you know, it's getting uncomfortable towards $100 per barrel. Outlook on that as well? Well, yeah, I remain very bullish on oil. I think oil goes materially higher. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite sector in global equities is energy. So in a global portfolio, I want to have weightings to India for obvious reasons, but I also want to hedge that with energy exposure was clearly energy is a vulnerability for uh, India. Though I think India is less vulnerable to rising oil prices than 10 years ago. But the irony is that President Xi, while he's not doing the Chinese economy or property market any favors with his um, you know, very um, strict COVID suppression policy, he's done the rest of the world, including India, a big favor because the one area where we have tangible evidence of demand destruction for any oil and energy in the global economy today is China. Okay. So the oil price would be materially higher today 
if China was not in implementing COVID suppression. You, you, you want to give us a level on, uh, you know, where you see crude uh, headed or the dollar index as well? Well, no, the, do the, do the dollar rally is in its final stages okay. here because, because I believe, you know, I believe the Fed is going to fudge its 2% target. <laughs> but the um, oil, yeah, oil, now obviously I'm saying the US can go into a recession next year in Europe. That's got to be the base case with the aggressive monetary tightening. That should be very negative for oil because it hits demand. So that is the risk to oil. But fundamentally, I think this oil cycle is different from one of all, all previous ones, because I believe the key positive for oil prices isn't demand, it's supply constraint. Mm. And we've had a dramatic lack of investment in energy oil in the last five years and more because of the political attack on fossil fuels in the Western world, right. which has disincentivized the oil and gas industry from investing. Okay. And you just saw Exxon, Chevron, I believe, re uh, report record profits last year. They're cutting their investment because there's all these political signals that they shouldn't be investing. And what they're doing is they're paying out more cash flow to shareholders and they're making some token investments in the renewable space to kind of appease the uh, political pressures for them to be doing more on renewables. Oh, yeah. But from a shareholder standpoint, they're paying out cash flow, mm. there's a lack of investment, and that leads to upward pressure on the oil price. So the irony is that the um, attack on fossil fuels of recent years right. creates the potential for a dramatic spike in the oil price to new or to new all-time highs. Okay, That's not a very happy combo if... Uh the world, uh, a large number of developed markets are heading into recession, but uh, crude still remains strong. Not a good combo for India. But, you know, the oh, positive, the you... yeah, the positive yeah, appears to be that in the BRICS combined, you know, Brazil has gone leftist. Uh, uh, Russia is uninvestable. China, you're saying, is looking uh, very difficult to find investment options given the slowdown. Uh, South Africa is not uh, the best of places. So, do you see more money coming into India? Are you looking at some levels that you can share with us for the Nifty uh, or for uh, uh, any of the major stocks? Well, on, on India, what's what's been amazing about India this year as a stock market is its phenomenal resilience in the face of a very weak Wall Street, in the face of record fall following foreign selling of Indian equities in the first six months of the of the year, and in the face of a quite significant monetary tightening cycle by the Reserve Bank of India. So I just I think I checked the numbers today. India is down, the Sensex is down about six percent in US dollar terms. Mm. The S P is down 18%, the Nasdaq's down 29%. So India has been phenomenally resilient. And what's happened from a fund flow standpoint is the foreigners having sold India in the first six months of this year have started to buy it back again last quarter. I understand what, why foreigners were selling India because it was at peak valuations and they were putting money into China late last year. I would have done exactly the same thing because China had started to ease fourth quarter last year when the rest of the world, uh, most of the rest of the world began to think about tightening following the Fed signal. So uh, people went into China, but clearly the move into China was undone by COVID suppression. Mm. So right now, I'm fundamentally staying overweight in India. I wish I'd been more overweight than I was. Uh, the reason I wasn't, I wasn't more overweight was because of my concerns about monetary tightening in India. Fundamentally, India is the opposite of China today. In China, we're looking at the biggest downturn in the residential property market in China since mm. it was privatized in 1994. That's the most important sector in the economy. In India, we're now in the second year of a residential property upturn after a yeah. seven-year downturn. Mm -hmm. yeah. That creates very positive multiplier of consequences for the domestic Indian economy. We see credit growth rising, and we see growing evidence that Indian corporates with healthy balance sheets are increasingly thinking about you know investing yes. okay. so to me India is very well set up and the resilience of the market this year the indian stock market in the face of a very bearish global um mm. environment tells you how good the, uh, the how well positioned india is domestically okay all right uh, you know chris uh, let's uh, get a little bit into that then uh, 
Uh, what are the changes you've made to your India portfolio? I recall the last time we chatted, I think Tata Steel made its way out. So you were a little bit jittery on that space. But the real estate basket, Macrotech made an entry. You lightened some positioning, I think, in Goodrich uh, properties, if I remember correctly. What's well, the recent changes you've made? I've hardly changed anything. I've, my portfolio is very much set up structurally for the domestic demand story in India based on uh, banks, property, insurance, if I had to sum it up, with one or two, with a bit of exposure to CapEx. And in my Indian dedicated portfolio, I have energy plays to hedge the obvious oil risk. Okay. Uh, you're not getting any of the IT companies back in? No, no, but that's not because I'm particularly negative on this. It's not my, uh, it's not, because this is a, this is, this is predominantly playing around the domestic demand theme. So I was expecting my portfolio to go down a bit this year because it's an interest rate sensitive, in fact, more than a bit, um, because of the, the monetary tightening cycle. But what's been remarkable is how, how resilient the market has been in the face of this monetary tightening. So, uh, Chris, just a final, uh, uh, you know, trader question. Does Nifty go to all-time highs in 22 itself? Uh, I mean, we're not a long way away from uh, 18,600. And uh, is 20,000 a reasonable expectation in 2024? Well, I think the key thing is the market, you know, if I think the Indian stock market can go materially higher in the next five years, assuming we remain in a property, residential property market upturn, and we get a crapex cycle following it. And I think the other point, which is less related to the stock market, but I think is very significant for the Indian economy, is all these issues in China increase the likelihood that there will be a significant increase in foreign direct investment in India in the manufacturing area. Yep, uh, we are seeing signs so, of that. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Chris Wood. It's great to end this interview on a very strong note, an optimistic note for our Indian viewers. Thank you very much for joining us in Thank this you. special edition of Market Masters.